Thanks, Margarita. And hello, everyone. First, thanks so much to Sonic Acts for the invitation. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure for me and Marilyn to take part in this program. So my name is uh, Tudil, and I'm here to talk about the film Reclaiming Vision, as Margarita introduced, uh, and that I made together with uh, Marilyn, who's sitting right over here. So Marilyn and I, we prepared this talk together. Uh, we would like to share with you some of our concerns and motivation for the making of our film and some thoughts on the topic of representation and perhaps, uh, or perhaps, dramatization of nature. So Reclaiming Vision was shot through a microscope in a laboratory with a cast consisting of aquatic microorganisms. I will introduce you to them soon and to something that is for the most part invisible in the film, their environment, the condition that most of the cast lives in, namely brackish waters. So depicting these in many ways overlooked organisms and environments, our film can be said to be a nature film. We consider it a nature fiction, like a sort of self-invented science fiction, and the response to the genre of nature documentary and how nature is represented in science as well as in popular media. We believe that the ways in which nature is represented has a great deal to say about how we can imagine and how we relate to our environment and cohabitants. And so our artistic approach in this project was to explore this topic and to experiment with genres. The film project was originally commissioned by the Munch Museum in Oslo. And it premiered in 2018 uh, as an outdoor screening projected across a river running into the Oslo Fjord where the Munch Museum will soon be located on reclaimed land in the harbor of Oslo, which was the previous image that you saw. The full length of the film is 26 minutes, and we have selected some clips to give you an impression. So let me introduce you to some of our cast. Here's a clip from the beginning of the film. So, as mentioned, our cast was mostly sampled from brackish waters. To be specific, the Oslo Fjord and the place where the film premiered. Although it is hard to actually see brackish water in the film, brackish as a phenomenon and as a metaphor has been important for us in the process. Brackish literally means somewhat salty. Uh, as a metaphor, it usually brings to mind something murky and dirty and even hostile to life. Most organisms don't thrive in brackish waters. And in Dutch, brak, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, can be used to refer to the state of feeling ill, for instance, after an intoxicated night out. And brackish is something in between, perhaps. And in my language, Norwegian, the word brak may be used to express that something is left to degrade or left to its own devices. In general, brackish is not considered anything good but it's not merely a metaphor. Because of global warming, sea levels are rising. Fresh water from melting ice caps and glaciers change the salinity of the world's oceans. 
So in a very concrete sense, brackish water is on the rise. And on the shores of these rising waters, we find many settlements, cities and civilizations. Brackish waters happens to be a characteristic of many of the hubs of the globalized capitalist world. Because estuaries are strategic places to settle down, many major settlements have been built next to the rivers running into the sea. Such locations, they provide both fresh water and access to the sea, meaning fertile land for transport and for trade. So think of major cities like Shanghai or Sao Paulo or New York, and Oslo is such a place as well, and as is Amsterdam. So in fact, the Brackegrund is named, where we are now, is named after the brackish waters that used to run underneath this very building. So if you change the perspective a bit, you could say that civilizations were, in fact, built around brackish waters. But let's zoom in on the inhabitants. As mentioned, the location where the film was screened also provided the source material for the film. The microorganisms are from this exact river and fjord in Oslo. And in that sense, the starting point for our project was micro-site specific. However, in highlighting the very small and the ultra-local, the project concerns global phenomena as well. As many of you will know, microorganisms living in the oceans are responsible for a large part of the world's oxygen produ um, production. The smallest inhabitants of the oceans absorb huge amounts of CO2 and contribute to regulation of our climate. Without marine microorganisms, planet Earth would become unlivable for most creatures. So even though these tiny critters are of vital importance for our ecosystem, we rarely see them represented in either nature documentaries nor environmental campaigns. So when did you last see a diatom, for instance, which is a major group of microalgae, as something to protect along the lines of whales and koalas and panda bears? As one of the marine biologists that we worked with said, microorganisms are not appealing to most people. They, they find it hard to relate to them. Diatoms don't have big sad eyes looking back at us that can trigger our emotions. Microorganisms don't seem to return our gaze. This psychological effect, let's call it the return gaze effect, or a mirroring effect, is in fact a real problem with actual consequences for the environment and our fellow beings. For the nature cons uh, conservationist, for instance, it becomes a question of resources and politics concerning who or what gets the atten attention and who or what gets to be saved. <coughs> for us as artists, it is a also a question about the ethics of representation. Do we have to mirror ourselves and our species in other animals and other living beings in order to relate and to care? Is it really possible to avoid any mode of self-reflection in trying to evoke empathy? And what role does aesthetics play in all of this? Going back to the film, I will now show another clip. The first part of the film presented some kind of biological diversity in brackish waters. The next fragment will be gradually move into, uh, moving into scenes populated with monocultures cultivated at a lab. These organisms never saw any river or sea.
monoculture that you just saw in that last shot contained a sample of euglenas, which are also what you can see here. Euglenas are popular organisms for study purposes. They are used as so-called model organisms to understand a wide range of biological phenomena. For instance, in studies of the perception of light. Well beyond human history, marine organisms like these euglenas developed the first ice spots. So you could say that vision evolved from the sea. And hundreds of millions of years later, we are able to look at these creatures with a microscope. This technological device allows us to observe the origin of sight and thereby our own abilities to see at all. The microscope and the microorganisms connect a dissing, dissing time span in the evolution of vision. And this idea of a cultivated vision, evolutionary and technologically, was an inspiration for the title Reclaiming Vision. One important question in the development of this project was the representation of nature. We both have an interest in how nature is mediated and what kind of relationships this, this evokes, for instance, through popular culture and in science. The lab and the microscope are in no way natural environments. And so what you can see with the microscope is always artificial at some level. Taking this into account, we decided to explore the genre of nature films, but with a clear aim to create a work of fiction. Hence the genre, nature fiction. So in our nature fiction film, the scenes are carefully constructed. The footage has been edited into a microbial drama with the aim to evoke empathy with our cast. And like many nature films, there is no narrator nor any factual information shared. And our visual drama is guided by the music, which is especially composed for the film by composer Henry Vega. So we customized the microscope to function fully as a film set, complete with sonography and artificial light on the camera. Alongside the living organisms, also the lab equipment, such as grids, and pipettes are featured. In the film, you can also see pollutants such as microplastics, oil, and pigments. These pollutants could be found in the fjord and in the sediments of the river where we collected our samples. The microscope itself is also, in a certain sense, visible in the film, not as an object, but through the visual effects that it produces. We made use of the particular aesthetic qualities that the light microscope allows, and deliberately made use of visual artifacts that the apparatus produced, such as air bubbles trapped under the cover slip. The slightest, sorry, the slightest movement in the body of the person operating the microscope is also magnified. So any shivering will be magnified in the, on the screen. And to quote philosopher of science Ian Hacking, we do not see through a microscope, we see with it. So I will now show a last clip, lasting about seven minutes.
Yeah, with that, to wrap up and to say a little bit about our intention with the film, uh, Reclaiming Vision can be seen as an experimental approach to evoke sensorial empathies for the less visible parts of our environment, and in this case specifically, microscopic inhabitants of brackish water. So important for us to point out is that we did not try to take on any other than a human perspective in this film. In fact, we purposefully anthropomorphized with the help of cinematic effects and the microscope as a culturally constructed way of seeing. 
And so we hope that our film will bring the viewers closer, not only literally, but also emotionally, to a part of our shared world that is usually out of sight. Thank you.